The Berlin Sportpalast, February 18, 1943. It is the high point of Josef Goebbels' career, a masterclass of manipulation. With his furious rhetoric, he binds Germany and its people once and for all to the fate of the Nazi party. Total war means total destruction. I'm Spartacus Olsen, and this is a World War II in real time special looking at Josef Goebbels' total war speech. We saw in January during the War Against Humanity series that Goebbels was concerned that the regime's propaganda effort was failing in the face of military reversals like the Allied landings in North Africa and the stalemate at Stalingrad. He also had no effective response to the recent Allied propaganda campaign focusing on the genocide of the Jews. To make matters worse, Goebbels is losing his most valuable propaganda weapon. German Führer Adolf Hitler spends most of his time holed up in the Wolfschanze in East Prussia. His health is deteriorating, his hands shake uncontrollably, and he is reluctant to appear in public or in propaganda reels. By now, he is on a roller coaster of medication and narcotics. His personal doctor, Theodore Morel, is administrating a daily cocktail of shots, drops, and pills that include methamphetamine, cocaine, barbiturates, anticonvulsants, bromide, and vitamins. This situation comes to a head with the February 3rd announcement of Germany's defeat at Stalingrad. The SS Sicherheitsdienst, SD, reports widespread depression and anger. For the first time, the public believes that the war may be lost. In Nuremberg, women tear newspapers from the hands of the vendors and wail with grief. Hitler has been largely immune from criticism, but among the crowds there is chatter that he is a liar. Goebbels sees the solution in what he calls a total and radical way of conducting the war both domestically and abroad. Total war. The population is to be inspired through a massive propaganda campaign emphasizing the danger Germany is in. Extra work will distract from setbacks. There will be a crackdown on parasites and idlers who shirk their duties. Hitler has agreed to the measure in principle, but has given only half-hearted support. He's reluctant to do anything which will impact the living standards of the middle and upper classes. He has agreed to the conscription of women into the workforce, but has lowered the maximum age from 55 to 45. As has been the hallmark of his rule, Hitler is unclear, ambiguous, and vacillating. The upper layers of the Nazi hierarchy squabble about how to interpret and influence the Führer. With this gradual withdrawal from the limelight, the ambiguity, squabbling, and manipulation has only increased. Chief of the Reich Chancellor Hans Lammers has persuaded Hitler to exempt women with children from conscription. Reichsmarschall Hermann Göring has opposed the closure of luxury shops and restaurants in a self-avowed effort to save his beloved establishment, Heucha, at which he dines for free. As February proceeds and his speech date approaches, Goebbels is determined to appeal directly to the public. He will break the deadlock among the leadership and fill the propaganda vacuum left by Hitler's absence. The venue, the Berlin Sportpalast's original purpose was to host popular sport events like ice hockey and boxing. But since the Nazis took power, it has become their favorite propaganda event hall. The high, curved bleachers form a perfect cauldron to whip up a storm. The 14,000-strong audience has been filled with party faithful. Wounded war veterans sit in the front rows, including 50 Knights Cross of the Iron Cross holders with their nurses. Goebbels calls it the best-trained audience you can find in Germany. The wiry 165 centimeters short propaganda minister will appear flanked by Nazi militants and officials against a backdrop of giant swastika flags and a banner proclaiming Totale Krieg, Kurzester Krieg. Total war, shortest war. Goebbels begins by addressing Stalingrad, which Nazi propaganda has framed as a heroic sacrifice for the defense of the Reich. Now Goebbels picks this up as a warning that Germany is under siege, that Stalingrad was in his fate's great alarm call to the German nation. 
according to Goebbels, now is not the time to ask how it all happened. That can wait until later. Rather than dwelling on the loss of the 6th Army, Germans must turn their attention to the threat they face from the east. Goebbels tells them, The storm raging against our venerable continent from the steppes this winter overshadows all previous human and historical experience. The German army and its allies are the only possible defense. This leads Goebbels on to what he calls his three theses regarding the war. The first of these is as follows. Were the German army not in a position to break the danger from the east, the Reich would fall to Bolshevism and all Europe shortly afterwards. This is indicative of a shift in the Nazi war narrative. The original justification of Operation Barbarossa was that of a preemptive strike, defending Germany against the treacherous Soviet Union. But ever since the invasion turned into a grinding war of attrition, the Nazis have sought to frame themselves as leaders of a pan-European struggle against Bolshevik barbarism. Goebbels declares that Bolshevism has always proclaimed its goals openly, to bring revolution not only to Europe, but to the entire world and plunge it into Bolshevist chaos. Working with collaborationist regimes and fascist movements, this portrayal serves to fill the ranks of various anti-Bolshevik volunteer divisions and Waffen-SS legions from across Europe. Efforts that will only increase as the front line comes ever closer to the Reich itself. Just last month, the Latvian Waffen-SS legion was established, and similar efforts will begin this month in Ukraine. Goebbels' rhetoric here is disingenuous at best to not say that it's simply rank hypocrisy. Yes, there has been a threat of Bolshevik or communist revolutions across Europe in the past decade, a threat fanned to various degrees, first by Bolshevik Russia and then the Soviet Union. Undoubtedly, the Soviet has shown itself to be a ruthless regime, capable of mass murder and genocide. But ever since Poland defeated the Red Army in the Polish-Bolshevik War and the Treaty of Riga in 1921, Soviet de facto dictator Josef Stalin and his cohorts have not been able, not even willing, to engage in a westward expansion of their communist empire. The trial run to maybe reignite communist expansion during the civil war in Spain failed and was only pursued half-heartedly in the last part of the war. It was the Nazis who enabled and abetted a renewed westward expansion of the USSR when they signed the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, giving Stalin carte blanche to annex the Baltic states and parts of Romania, to not mention co-invading Poland together with the Germans in September 1939. An alliance that the Germans then betrayed with their invasion of the USSR, not the other way around. But the Nazis' ideological motivation to oppose Bolshevism is part of the mythological Weltanschauung based on an imaginary cultural war. For Goebbels, behind the Bolshevik specter stands his oldest enemy, the Jews. He tells his audience, The goal of Bolshevism is Jewish world revolution. They want to bring chaos to the Reich and Europe using the resulting hopelessness and desperation to establish their international Bolshevist concealed capitalist tyranny. Accusing the Jews of being simultaneous agents of Bolshevism and capitalism is no contradiction in the warped world of Nazi ideology. It's part of the victimization myth that ties the Soviet Union and the Western Allies into a global Jewish conspiracy aimed to destroy Germany and European civilization. Judeo-Bolshevism is founded on the thesis that Jews are responsible for the communist revolutions that have occurred across the world. It abuses the apparent but false idea that Bolsheviks were primarily Jews. It points to the Jewish family origins of, for instance, Leo Trotsky, but ignores the deeply Christian background of, for instance, Stalin, to fabricate evidence of a Jewish domination of communism through confirmation bias. <laughs> Likewise, looking west, Goebbels and Hitler declare that their British and American enemies are plutocratic states dominated by Jewish capital. This is the same Jewish capital that had supposedly been responsible for Germany's loss in World War I, the corruption of Weimar democracy, and the subjugation of Aryan workers and businesses. It's, of course, total nonsense. Like in Germany, in the US, and Great Britain, the very small minority of Jews, like most ethnicities, range from the very poor 
to the very rich. Even when you add all of their wealth together, it's a tiny fraction of overall wealth. Again, they use confirmation bias to find evidence by pointing at, for instance, the Rothschild family, while ignoring the super wealthy and indeed very powerful Rockefeller, Mellon, or Ellerman families, all born from British or Irish Christian origins. But back to Goebbels and his speech. He now needs to cement the victimization myth of Germany and place the Germans in a position of being the only power willing and able to resist the Judeo-Bolshevik threat. The thesis he presents is that only the German Reich and its allies are in position to resist this danger. He claims that the corrupted forces of Europe and Anglo-America are blind to the Judeo-Bolshevik threat. In fact, they have already been infiltrated. Goebbels speaks of a recent by-election in the British House of Commons. The independent, that is, communist candidate, got 10,741 of the 22,371 votes cast. This was in a district that had formerly been a conservative stronghold. This is proof that the Bolshevist danger exists in England too. It's another twisting of the truth. A by-election was held on February 11th to elect an MP for Midlothian and Peebles Northern, a parliamentary constituency in Scotland close to Edinburgh. It's true that this seat had been held by an MP from the Unionist Party, a Conservative Party. It's true that in the election, a new candidate reduced the Unionist majority, picking up nearly 11,000 votes. But the newcomer is not a communist. He represents the Common Wealth Party, a socialist democratic party inspired by long-established syndicalist and cooperative traditions. They reject state-dominated socialism as practiced in the Soviet Union. And no, it's not part of some wider communist surge. By the end of the month, the Commonwealth Party will have stood for four more by-elections and will have lost them all. By the end of the war, they will have a grand total of three members of parliament in a House of Commons which seats 615. That's not to mention that the actual communists, the Communist Party of Great Britain, have one seat in parliament. Yes, one. So Judeo-Bolshevism is nonsense and it isn't engulfing Britain. But that doesn't stop Goebbels from invoking a deadly menace hanging across the world. His final thesis is that this monumental threat requires an immediate and radical response. We must act quickly and decisively, or it will be too late. In the end, there will not be winners and losers, but the living and the dead. This nihilistic interpretation is in response to the Casablanca Declaration, which the Allies demanded unconditional surrender. Roosevelt declared on February 12th, we mean no harm to the common people of the Axis nations, but we do mean to impose punishment and retribution upon their guilty barbaric leaders. So Goebbels knows if Germany is defeated, it is likely that he, along with Hitler and their associates, will face execution. He wants to bind the German people into a murder-suicide pact, though. They must commit themselves with ever greater effort to the war, or they will be destroyed. Suitably terrified, they are ready to hear his message. He begins his explanation of total war by going on the attack, berating those who he claims are not pulling their weight. It is time to get the slackers moving. They must be shaken out of their comfortable ease. We cannot wait until they come to their senses. To combat the slackers, bars and nightclubs will be closed. Luxury restaurants and shops which demand scarce resources will follow suit. Civil servants will get increased workloads as some of them go to the front. Pleasure seekers and holiday makers who supposedly spend weeks in spas and occupy the capacity of the railways will be punished. In a stroke of irony, given the Führer's habit of sleeping late and start the workday around midday to then launch into endless berating of his staff, long whinging monologues, refusal to read most briefings because they're too long and boring, punctuated by frequent tea breaks, interrupted by walks with the dogs, to usually end in late afternoon with a long lazy dinner and movies. He urges his audience to follow the example of their hardworking leader. But Goebbels is keen to reassure that some of the joys of the Führer will also be at the people's disposal. Cinemas will remain open, 
Go figure. His favorite propaganda tool, the radio, will even expand its programming. But except for that, it's time for Germany to focus to only work for or fight the war. Hundreds of thousands of previously exempt men will be induced into the armed forces. The closure of non-essential businesses will bring workers into the armaments industry. Reversing a decade of Nazi policy of excluding women from the workforce, women are now to be conscripted for labor. It might sound like a solid idea that the United Nations allies are already following, but it is too late and too little to bridge the industrial gap to the enemy. Standing with Goebbels at the Sportpalast are the Minister of Armaments and War Production, Albert Speer, and the General Plenipotentiary for Labor Deployment, the Slave Master of Europe, Fritz Saukel. The harsh reality is that no matter what Goebbels promises to achieve with these measures, there are simply not enough Germans to negotiate this war at the scale it has grown. So Speer and Saukel will continue to rely on increasing the millions of slaves that have become the suffering, dying backbone of the German war economy. Nonetheless, it is this combination of effort and exploitation that Goebbels presents as a path to victory. He compares the present situation with that of Frederick the Great, King of Prussia in the 18th century, of whom Hitler is a great admirer. Frederick beat the odds fighting a stronger Austro-Russian army in the Third Silesian War during the Seven Years' War, and according to legend, he was outnumbered almost 20 to 1. It's an ironic metaphor. Sure, the Prussian king began that war outnumbered on paper, but not anywhere close to 20 to 1. And the reality of war at the time meant that most battles were fought with equal forces, and when Frederick was heavily outnumbered, he often lost. More pertinent to the irony of Goebbels' comparison, the war ended in large part because Russian Tsar Peter had expanded his resources on too many wars and sued for peace. No territorial gains were made on either side, and Peter even provided parts of his forces to Frederick to end the war, an end that was little more than a stalemate with the Austrian emperor. But Goebbels' point is not military or political reality. It's faith. He argues that despite suffering numerous defeats, Frederick kept his stubborn belief in victory. Goebbels says that the great king remained unbroken, that he was unshaken by the changing fortunes of war, that his strong heart overcame every danger. He wants to paint a glorious light at the end of the tunnel based on magical thinking in the name of a great national hero. With that beacon lit, Goebbels proceeds to his crescendo to whip his audience into frenzy. He puts the ideal picture of Prussian faith in juxtaposition to foreign disdain for Germany. The English maintain that the German people has lost its faith in victory. I ask you, do you believe with the Führer and us in the final total victory of the German people? He then continues this interchange of British supposed opinions of German weakness lack of resolve and inability to wage this war, with rhetorical questions begging to feelings of exceptional destiny and leading to an affirmation to the contrary. With each question, he raises the bar and his tone, and his obedient audience responds with ever more enthusiastic cheering, shouts of agreement and siegs of Sieg Heil. He asks them to shoulder the heaviest personal burdens as they follow Hitler through thick and thin towards a final total victory and to make an oath that the homeland stands behind the men at the front. With his fourth question, he gains their assent for his program. Do you want total war? If necessary, do you want a war more total and radical than anything that we can even imagine today? It's a hint at the darkness and desperation which is to come as the war slides further and further out of Germany's control. Having entrapped his countrymen and women in this macabre murder-suicide pact, he lets them loose. Like a vicar sending his flock out to spread the word, he commands, Now, people, rise up and let the storm break loose. By the reaction of the people in the Sportpalast, it sounds like Goebbels has indeed whipped his people into a fanatical frenzy. An emotion broadcast across the radios of Germany to sweep up the millions of listeners at home into this storm. 
Later that evening, Goebbels meets with Albert Speer and reveals the magic trick. Did you notice? They reacted to the smallest nuance and applauded at just the right moments. It was the politically best trained audience you can find in Germany. An audience reaction he badly needs because this war has just entered a new phase. It is a fulfillment of Hitler's prophecy that if the German people shall at some point no longer be strong and willing enough to sacrifice its blood for its own existence, then it should go under and be exterminated by another more mighty power. But if the Germans stop fighting, that prophecy cannot be fulfilled. Because despite Goebbels' rhetoric, despite the Nazi religion of eternal racial struggle, the extermination of the German people is not the goal. The goal is to end German aggression. But in a masterstroke of circular logic, Goebbels has just tuned the German people for never-ending aggression, which by force of reality is the path to self-fulfill Hitler's prophecy, extermination. Never forget.